But we're, we're talking about various things, and one of them, one of the things that came up was, um, and, it, and it can per really pertain to meditation, and, and it's about doership. I don't know if you've heard that term, doership, before. But in, in this case, it's, it's more, uh, more of a non-doership than anything. And this, um, this non-doership is the idea that um, we aren't you know, doing anything ourselves. And what I mean by that is it's like um, comparing ourselves. I thought about this earlier and you know, maybe a good way to to describe it. And if we use the, the computer as an analogy and how we can program a computer and somebody else can come along and program the same computer and, you know, actually hundreds of people can, can uh, you know, program the computer and we can buy programs um, and uh, install information. And we do it all the time, actually. Most of us do it all the time, each day. and. So internally, that computer is uh, different inside, and it functions a little bit differently because of that information. Sometimes it's the memory isn't big enough and it slows down, and, and uh, sometimes it works fine, and all, all these various things can happen. We most of us know how, you know, if we've ever had computer problems, how they how they work, and that kind of thing. But, and with that computer, we can unplug it and we can take it someplace else and plug it back in and it, it works, you know, if the electricity current is the same. And, uh, or we can even take the hard drive out and put it in a different computer and it works. And so, to think in terms of that, the programs and information that's put in that computer and to compare it with, with uh, humans, you know, with ourselves and how we, um, get along in the world, you know, with our senses. We see and hear, smell and taste and, and touch, all these different things. So all this information is actually uh, coming into us. You know, it's like we're being programmed by our experiences and by the things that we um, touch and see and everything that we do in our life. So in essence, we're being programmed you know, very much like that computer and we can uh, even uh, take a look at different information that comes in and see how we react to that information basically by how we have been programmed you know, in the past. Uh, for example, something might, um, somebody might say something to us that uh, can kind of stir things up for us, so to speak. And if we felt like that was a personal attack on us, it would be um, pretty annoying for us. But if we felt that it wasn't that person's fault, and it wasn't my fault, it wasn't, you know, these, it was just these different circumstances coming together that that person said these things to us, and that it wasn't really meant for us as a personal attack, that would change things altogether. That would uh, change our opinion of it and our view of it. And so even, uh, and that's uh, based on our past programs, you know, how we've been programmed. I'm trying to make this as simple as possible here. And this, the idea of this non-doership, or that we are the non-doer, is, is very much related to um, this programming and how when something happens to us, uh, some, some experience happens, uh, that it is a combination of many, many different things coming, uh, coming together, actually coming together and, um, and coming together with us you know, as a human being, so that information goes, comes inside. But when we when we look at these experiences, it's not from one coming from one single individual area. It's coming from many different areas. There are all these causes and conditions coming together, and then they they kind of collide with us, and that's our experience. 
And so when we look at these things, we can see that it, it's not really us as an individual that's causing this experience or even having this experience. It seems like it sometimes, but, but it isn't the, the individual that is, is doing any of it. It's the causes. It's just like if we put all this, this, this information in a computer, it wasn't the computer that was the doer of that. The computer didn't ask for this information. It just happened. It just went inside. In the same way with us, when we get information, from, even from the time we're in the womb, you know, and in past lives or whatever, you know, throughout our entire experience, we have this information coming at us, but it's not necessarily uh, directed, you know, at us personally. It's just all these things coming together and, um, and coming into this experience, what we call an experience. So there's really no um, individual behind it. And that's why in uh, different Buddhist teachings and non-dual teachings, they say that we're uh, empty of individual existence. Um, we, a lot of us have heard the term emptiness, and that's what they're speaking of. And so that it has everything to do with, uh, with karma as well. We would, when we, we go back and look at that computer, we can, like I said, we can plug a computer in a different wall, and you know, we can turn it off and turn it back on, and the, in, the information is still inside. And we can even take the disk out, like a, a computer disk, you know, or an external hard drive, for example, and put it into another computer, and the information is right there. And if, if we can compare that with, uh, with our karma, our karmic experiences, especially from the standpoint that the Buddha the Buddhists said, we, the only thing that goes from this life to another life is our uh, actions, which is our karma. And so when we relate that to a computer, first the question come, comes up, or the, the, uh, um, the, the, um, the idea that the computer has this hard drive, this physical thing that we can see, and you know, we don't, because we can't see karma. We can't see the result of these actions. We can experience it, but we can't, we can't see it. And the only thing we can uh, say in relation to that is that there's some, um, some type of source you know, not anybody keeping score, but there's like a source that is um, uh, we could say that it is allowing this to um, be passed on from, or not allowing, but is um, uh, ha allowing, well, let's just say allowing this to happen, with, that it's this karma, or these actions are passed from one experience to another, to another, or even one life to another, to another, and so on. And the uh, the and then the idea gets like, the, the, what is the source? You know, um, some people might call it by different names. And the Buddha said that uh, he didn't say that there was. He didn't denounce that there was not a God, for example. But he said that teaching of, of a God um, will not lead us out of, uh, directly out of suffering, out of the kind of suffering that we experience. Um, he said because, it's, it's, because again, it's, it's that type of thing that we do not see, you know, that we can't tangibly touch. And so that's why I'm just calling it uh, the source, you know, the... Um, you know, could, we could call it God or whatever we want, but it's almost as if somebody's in charge of that, that uh, karma, you know, that goes from life to life. But what I will, the reason I'm bringing this up is because the non-doership is something that we can experience and practice in our meditation, that we are just resting, that we're actually stepping back and allowing ourselves to, um, to say that, this is okay, everything's fine, just the way it is. And that we're not asking for anything to be different in this moment. There's so, just like, just imagine if we had 100 
percent acceptance for the moment, for everything that's happening in this, at this moment, or let's just say uh, during our meditation practice anyway. It's, um, it's not easy to do when we have an itch, we want to itch it, we're not completely accepting it, and that there's nothing wrong with doing that, but we want to do it mindfully. We want to you know, know, that, know that we're itching an itch. If we're uncomfortable in the body and we, uh, for some reason we feel as if I just can't accept this right now, I have, to, I have to move. And that's fine too, as long as we understand, as long as we know that we're purposely not accepting something, that we're aware of that, that that's happening. So acceptance is, um, is a big part of this, this, this non-doership, especially when we look at it in terms of, you know, our, our half hour or 40 minute meditation practice. So that's the invitation this evening. So be able to experience your, your meditation, um, the mind of, of non-doership and, and acceptance with everything. And if, you can, if we can do that, we will have a very good meditation. Any questions from anybody? When we, when we start the meditation, I'll guide us through for the first 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever it turns out to be. And in that guiding is instructions. Um, so if you're new to meditation and you want to, want to follow some instructions, they will be in the guiding. And some people just like to have something to listen to, something to focus on, you know, with their, with their, with their ears, you know, while we're meditating. But I will be talking about the breath, and the breath is, is something that I refer to as our meditation object. And the breath is um, our focal point for the most part, to use the breath as something to concentrate on. So, if you want to make yourself comfortable, Try to relax into the moment as much as you possibly can. Gently close the eyes. Bring your attention to the body. And with the body, if you can remember to keep the back fairly straight. If you're sitting in a chair, you might want to consider keeping both feet on the floor. Some of us might do well by reminding ourselves to lift the chin a little bit and keep it lifted. And most of this is just to keep energy flowing up and down or around the body. So we do need energy in our meditation practice. Without energy, we get lethargic and in many ways we waste the moment. We get very relaxed and half asleep. And although it might feel wonderful, we probably aren't re actually meditating, or at least not as deeply as we could if we have energy within the body. Another thing that brings energy in the body, of course, is the breath. And if we do get tired or lethargic, we can focus on the inhalation of the breath not changing the breath or anything, but just focusing on the energy that comes in when we breathe in. In some situations, we might want to focus on the exhalation, which we can find is much more relaxing than the inhalation. Go ahead and experiment, experiment with this a little bit. Notice the relax, relaxation of the exhalation and how that feels. 
the body is kind of wound up from the day and the mind is feel very busy. Sometimes we want to use that relaxation to, to unwind and still the mind, calm the body. Alternatively, if we want to pay attention to the inhalation, bring our attention to the top of the inhalation, we can notice that there's a, a little bit more energizing, it's, there's some energy there. And again, we're not trying to change the breath. We're not trying to change anything. We're just observing. So many of us are using the breath as a meditation object. We can feel the breath as we breathe in and out. We can visualize the breath. We can count the breaths. We can do many different things with it. We can focus on the inhalation or the exhalation. So even if each one of us in this room is using the breath, we might be using it in different ways. But the reason for the breath and why we use it in this way is we need something to come back to. We need something to focus on. Otherwise, the mind will wander off. In the untrained mind, it's very difficult to, to keep it settled. And so we purposely bring it back to something that we're very hopefully familiar with, and that's the breath in this case. So the breath is a tool for us to bring our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions into this still place called presence. When we're present, We're not making plans for the future. We're not wondering what we're going to be doing in the next moment or the next day or the next year. We're giving ourselves permission not to worry about the future, not to be fearful, not to fix anything, but to accept everything that might happen in the future. And we're giving ourselves permission not to be concerned or bring up memories of the past. And again, there's a great deal of acceptance that is sometimes required to lay down and set aside all these memories of things that have happened, whether they're good or bad. 
is just simply not necessary at this time. If we want to really experience a, a good meditation practice. And so ideally in this presence, there is no past and there's no future. There can still be thinking but the thoughts are more uh, functional thoughts, like noticing, uh, we might notice a sound. We might notice that we're going to have to remind ourselves to come back to the breath. We might notice that the thought of reminding ourselves to lift our chin or straighten our back a little bit. So it's very much the working mind, the, the, the thoughts that are not harmful, very practical in, in, the, uh, in the moment. And then eventually these can subside as well. When we practice meditation consistently, and wonderful things can happen, incredible things can happen. The, the mind can shift into a neutral gear or out of gear into neutral, I guess you could say. And so the idea of focusing on the breath is not so uh, distant. It's actually a oneness where we we feel that we ourselves and the breath are one because that's our only intention is to very lightly feel the sensation of the breath. And so we become that sensation. And in that is, uh, the, again, the presence and we can become very, very familiar with it. And then we realize that this is really who we are beyond the thinking mind. And so in meditation, we're resting in this presence, this is again the non-doership. We're not asking for anything to change. We're not trying to be somebody or do anything different or have anything in the moment. We're not trying to protect anything or do anything other than just try to sit in this presence and experience our true nature. And if we can do this in our formal meditation practice, then we can more easily learn to do this in our everyday life. And the result is being less reactive to thoughts of the past, less reactive to feelings and emotions that are seemingly happening in the, in the moment, and less reactive to thoughts and fears of the future and the need to constantly fix something. So meditation allows us to function more 
by instinct and intuition than by reacting and many times overreacting. And we can take a little deeper than normal inhalation of the breath, bring some energy into the body. And gently exhale. Do this again, a little deeper than normal inhalation. Slowly exhale. And one more time, and deeper than normal inhalation of the breath. Thank you. Um, anyway, so there's some flyers here. Uh, I hope what I mentioned, you know, about meditation and about the um, non-doership or non-doer non-doing is was advantageous for for us as meditators you know to be able to just sit and relax and accept everything just the way it is very important for meditation a lot of times people um, they, they meditate I hear more and more about it where they go into meditation and then they start fixing their problems you know and that can be a, a habit um, and in most cases, you know, if we set the intention that we're going to be meditating, you know, doing that fixing can be a bad habit because um, we're not really meditating the way. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that uh, I have these, uh, I think they're eight by three, eight by three and a half garden plots, you know, by two by eights. And I put soil in there and I plant the tomatoes and I have carrots and cucumbers in there now and a lot of peppers and garlic and onion and things like that. And if there's, if there's, I try to keep the weeds out, you know, so that everything will, will grow and take advantage of the fertilizer I have in there and everything. So it's like a really good analogy for the mind, you know, if we can, um, you know, just pick these weeds from time to time. Um, you know, and just kind of keep it nice. It, it really, uh, it, it really helps. Uh, you know, the good things grow. You know, the beneficial things in the mind grow. Um, but we, but with those, we have to keep the weeds out. And the best way to do that is to get the root. You know, get really get down there in the root. And that's what we're doing in our meditation practice. We're digging a little deeper. You know, get those weeds out of there. And. It, it's, it's not like it takes a lot of work and for most of us to, to really do that. It just happens naturally every time we go into this silence because we're doing something that the mind really isn't used to, it really isn't used to doing. You know, we haven't, um, unless we've been meditating since we were three years old, which isn't likely for most of us, um, it takes, you know, we, we have to do some, some deprogramming, you know, to do in order to really understand that presence that I was talking about, 
and to be in that presence. That presence is like, it's like backing up and saying that, oh, everything is fine. Everything is fine in the moment. And just kind of recognizing that in our meditation, but also when we're outside of meditation, to be able to to be able to touch that and really kind of bask in it. And like I say, it, a lot of times it's it's like stepping back and and seeing that everything is okay, not taking everything so serious. That's that helps too. You know? Relaxing a little bit. Um, you people that have been meditating for a while, do you want to say something about your practice? The camera is set up in such a way that the microphone can pick up the room sound too, not just me. So if somebody wants to say something about their practice, they can. And they'll be able to be heard. And they'll be, able, they'll be broadcast all over the world. Think about it. How fun, huh? <laughs> So the challenge has been put out. I can say that when I first started coming here in the 40 minute meditation, it was like, it seemed like forever. Forever. Yeah, yeah. and I was like, after about 15 minutes, I was miserable. I was like, oh, this is going to be over. <laughs> but uh, I've been doing like, for about a year now, I've been doing like a half hour every day at home. Yeah, great. And now I come here and it's like, it doesn't seem like anything. It's like it almost ends before I want it to end. <laughs> yeah, you start getting comfortable and kind of relax into it. And how long does it take you? Do you know, do you have a, a lot of people when they meditate consistently, they kind of know how long it takes them before they kind of get into that comfort zone? And some people it happens right away, but a lot, some people it'll be 10 or 20 minutes. Usually like 15 minutes in. Yeah. That's why, that's why 15 minutes wasn't enough for me. And I went to 20, and then I, yeah. I'm up to about 30 now. Because yeah. I figure 15 minutes to get settled down and another to be really calm. Yeah, that's a good practice. You just sit in silence? No, I actually listen to uh, the these, these podcasts. Oh. These 30 minute uh, meditations. Got and he, he does like you, where he talks for a little bit and then. And he's silent. And then it's silent. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, good. As long as, I always like to hear people say that they have some si at least some silence yeah. or half of half of it is silence in their meditation. Yeah. But I think it gets I like it because it gets me back on track sometimes. If he if he talks then I'm like, oh okay, I gotta get back. <laughs> there I am. <laughs> yeah. Like coming back home. Good. I know I'm in the zone like you were talking about, when I see those colors I was telling you about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I forget what you call that when you see a visual. A uh, nimitta. Yeah. Yeah. I should write that down. Um, but you asked how long it takes to get there. And really, it depends on what I'm walking in here with. Like if I yeah. came in. Um, what's it depends on what's in your backpack, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But like uh, when we do the three day meditations, um, you know, the second day it like happens within minutes, you know. But the first day, I don't know. Sometimes I don't even get there, so I'm just, yeah, it takes a long time to calm down. Yeah, so. well, that's anyway, good. It's very helpful. Very helpful to me. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, Amy uses, she has, she, um, she mentioned uh, these, uh, sometimes people use lights or colors or something in their, in their field of vision, you know, their, in their, in their um, uh, imagery, you know, with the eyes closed. Um, and that's called, a nimitta, which is a Pali word, which means a mind sign. So the what that does, is it's a substitute for something like the breath. We can, we can focus. We need something to focus on. And if if we close our eyes and there's a a um, a regular pattern, uh, oftentimes it's a single light. And sometimes it's swirling lights or, or colors, certain colors. And, 
um, uh, some people actually they, they see you know some some people I hear people that they see indigo and things like that um, more commonly like uh, uh, a, a white light like a flashlight in the distance or a train out in the distance coming towards you but if that if we close our eyes and that appears then that can that's a sign that we are concentrated because if it's it's one of those things like we go oh there's that light and then it's gone, you know. Uh, so if we just relax into it, we, we, the, the light or the color or whatever it might be comes up, then we can use that as our meditation object and not the breath or anything like that. And it happens for some people and it doesn't happen for others. Um, sometimes it, uh, I've had people uh, come in here that were brand new meditators and they asked what that light was. And... I didn't say what light. You, are you? You're nuts. You know? <laughs> but uh, you know, you have to explain to people what, what it is, and um, then they can use it. They can use it for their meditation practice. And if that happens to to some of you, that's wonderful. But you know, don't try to necessarily create it, and and you know, try to create this light or this color. Anything else from anybody? John. I've been meditating for about 25 years. And I switched over when I, after I took your course here five years ago. I switched over to, to Boston. And um, I, have a, I, used, I used to do TM you know, twice a day. Mm. But I, I found this to be more effective. Uh, for some reason, it's kind of hard to fix it my finger, but yeah. I, for me, meditation works because I do it every time, every day at the same time. And I clear my emails, I clear any phone calls, and then I meditate through the next. Oh, you do that stuff first, huh? and then you yeah, meditate? I get anything out of the way that yeah. will come in from the business and get rid of that. Yeah. And, and then, uh, the difference for me, I think, came when, when I realized that I was taking a lot of the practice uh, to work with me and uh, into other situations where uh, you know, not, there's not many big deals after a while. Yeah. And, uh, and I work in a therapeutic environment, so I teach a lot of people to meditate because. Every, everybody who comes to me with a problem, it's always the past or the future, and they're never present. Mm -hmm. Meditation is about being present. Mm -hmm. and, and meditation, I mean, there's, there's, you know, the one thing I have, I have, I, I, I take a lot of input from others. Uh, I listen to a lot of meditation stuff besides what I'm hearing. There is, no, there is no goal in meditation, and there's no right way or wrong way. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. right. and that's kind of what I've learned. And, and so I'm, I'm, sometimes my mind is like a monkey, and sometimes I have this perfect meditation, and sometimes I go, gosh, I don't know how to meditate. But it's been a good experience. And I took another course in mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is very popular among our clients because a lot of them have a difficult time relaxing. Yeah. But, uh, and and, and I, I, I read a lot about uh, what, what meditation does to our amygdala and our prefrontal cortex and the, and the different parts of our brain, how, how it changes. I take in a lot of information that is also helpful. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah, thanks for sharing, John. Um, he, John mentioned TM, um, Transcendental Meditation. And uh, that's a practice that um, is, is a, it's a fairly popular practice. It was, uh, it was made popular by, you know, the, by the Beatles, primarily. 
Um, and now it, it, it's a kind of a practice of a, a lot of celebrities still um, are kind of drawn to it for, for whatever reason. They have a way of, of taking the practitioners and um, kind of highlighting them and, and asking them, um, Ellen, Eleanor DeGeneres, you know, people like that to, to speak about TM. Um, and there's, there's quite a few uh, famous people that practice it. Of course, there's a lot of famous people that practice Vipassana as well. But TM, instead of using um, the breath or the nimitta or anything like that, they, they use mantra. And mantra is an inner dialogue, uh, words, you know. Um, usually it's um, like a Sanskrit saying or something that, um, a phrase that doesn't really have uh, any meaning. It doesn't really have to have any meaning. Um, although it could, you know, but, but the phrase doesn't. And it, it seems like people that are more, um, more, maybe more linguistic or maybe more into words, uh, it works well for them to use that as their meditation object rather than the breath. And so that's you know something that a person can experiment with too. It's it's not the mantra isn't said out loud or anything like that. We would have trouble meditating as a group if we all had mantras and we were saying them out loud because all the mantras are different, you know. Um, so they're they're said silently inside inside the mind. So nobody and, has a uh, nobody has a uh, the same one. Well, and, but maybe by accident, uh, you know, there might be something like that. But usually, um, it's um, it's pertains to their teacher and their date of birth. So. Um, it, it, uh, the chances that somebody would have the same teacher and the same date of birth are, are very likely. So what's an example of one? Have you ever heard uh, one? Omagad Mohuda. Something like that. <laughs> Just uh, the Sanskrit words. You're not, you're not supposed to tell anybody. It's a secret. A secret mantra. Yeah. So if that was my mantra, I would be, I would be out, you know. <laughs> interesting, interesting thing about TM, that's one of the most widely studied uh, uh, until John kabat came along and started studying uh, mindfulness and brought it into the secular. But, but uh, they did an interesting experiment that's, that's documented. They, they believe that if one, I think it was one-tenth of one percent of the population meditated at the same time, that it would have an effect on the crime rate yes. and uh, uh, you know, abuse and mm -hmm. you know, robbery and rape and drug abuse, all that stuff. And I think they picked a city back east, like New York or something. And, and the D a, DC, I think it was. It was a DC, yeah. yeah. And you can find the, the thing on the find it in there. But you can Google it and, and uh, they actually and demonstrated it, it during that, I don't know what, Length of time it was up and called three days or something. Yeah. But then all of the crime rate and everything did go down. It did, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, if you go online and, and look at a lot of the, the, the studies that have been done on meditation, a lot of them come from the TM, you know, movement. They, um, they do charge for the, basically they charge for the mantra. They charge $1,000. And, $1, and uh, uh, in some, yeah, in some cases about $1,000. It, 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 it depends on a person's uh, income too. In, in some cases, but they say that they they use that money for uh, research, and they do indeed they do use it for some of it for research because there's a lot that they've done out there. And why is, um, the, why is the mantra a secret? What's the um, besides the money side, of course? But mm -hmm. why was the spiritual or the the logical explanation now? That's another secret. <laughs> <laughs> That's another secret. There's a power in the words that are chosen. It just it just loses its power when you start spewing it. Because somebody will say, "Oh, you got such a neat mantra. I wish I had that mantra. Could we trade?" You know, all this all this stuff going on and on. But 
They don't have an eBay for Montrose where you can trade them. And so mm -hmm. you can't. They're secret. <laughs> How can you trade story. something that is, is, is yours? I'll give you one because. Ten bucks. Okay. Uh, the way they lost G with TM was about flying. That's when you reach a certain level of meditation, you can flow to fly. And that's the same thing. That's where we're going to do that next week here. <laughs> yeah. Well, the the TM it it works uh, solely by the. I mean, it, it works because of the consistency. Twenty twenty minutes in the morning and twenty minutes at night, and that's a wonderful practice. If we, if I mean any any meditation practice, if you do it twenty minutes in the morning and twenty minutes at night, it will work. And um, so that's why I'm advocate of consistency. You know? And I suspect that if you use the mantra "Om," oh, twenty minutes in the morning and twenty minutes at night every day for the rest of your life, it'd probably be just as effective as any secret mantra. It would work. The thousand dollars on the The thousand. Yeah, you could save a thousand bucks. So you think it's beneficial for Vipassana to do it twice a day or just once a day or? I, I think it's great to do it twice a day. Um, I don't ask people to do that. I don't even ask them to meditate for a certain time, but to do it every day. You know, I think I think if a person meditated when the sun came up, and then they meditated again when the sun came down. It would be per it would be a wonderful practice. Yeah, I've been thinking about adding a second one at night, but I yeah. don't know. <laughs> Yeah, and some people, I mean, it's different. It's completely different, you know. Um, when I meditate in the morning, it's a different, completely different feel than at night for me. It's, um, there's less inhibitions in the morning. I mean, I wake up and I don't start thinking about, you know, the, this and that or, you know, the other thing and, and just start meditating. But by, you go through your entire day and then you go, well, I gotta sit down and meditate. Uh, it's not so bad here in a group, but by yourself, it's a little bit hard for me to settle down like I can in the morning. Um, it's not its not difficult. I mean, it can be done, but I, but I notice a difference. Yeah. In the morning, do you meditate before or after coffee? <laughs> usually, That's a really good question, yeah. yeah good us question. Us for real. Usually after coffee. Yeah. 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 I have a cup in the morning, and then I'm, and I'm set. Yeah. I have to get that. That 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 kick, I guess you know, going. But first thing I do is I I download. You know, I'll have a piece of paper next to me and a pencil and write down the things that are on. You know, creeping up in my mind, like I got to do this, got to do that, got to do this. I'll download and write every write this stuff down, and then give my sit, then set the intention. You know, give myself permission to uh, let all that stuff go. Anything else from anybody? I know, like John said, he, he gets up and checks his email, like, first thing, and I was like, for me, I can't. But you're at the office, though, right, John? Or is that at home? No, I'm at home. Oh, okay. But, but I have early morning people that got things that they might have a question. Yeah. 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 Mine's usually something I gotta do, and it's like I'll be thinking about it the whole time I'm meditating if I read it. <laughs> so yeah, I don't read anything yeah. before. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm the same way, but and that's why it's a little bit different in the evening for me. Yeah. Okay. I, again, I got six copies of. If you want some more information about the program that's starting on Monday, thank you everybody for coming. Um, any other information? Tune into meditationlearningcenter.com about the retreats that are coming up and that kind of thing. Let me know if I can ever help you with anything. Thanks. <laughs>